everybody. I'm Scott Rodell here at the British Museum, back again, and we're going to go inside and have a look at a really fantastic Han Dynasty gin. So let's go right in. So here we have this really wonderful uh, Han Dynasty gin. It's from a grave, so it's grave goods. Uh, but what's also really interesting about this piece is it's not actually a genuine sword. It's, you could say it's a model of a sword. And the reason for that was because that during the Han Dynasty, they didn't want uh, the nobles to have too lavish of uh, grave goods. So it's, it's a perfect model of a sword, you could say, but it's not a true sword itself. For our purposes, though, it's very interesting. Because it's made of lacquer, uh, it hasn't degraded in the same way that a steel or iron sword would have that had been in the grave. But over time, of course, it begins to fleck, uh, flake and fall apart. Uh, so these are really interesting swords. Uh, and they're very popular today. Chinese seem to be really interested in these Han Dynasty swords. And there are a lot of people who talk about how these might have been used, what the sword play of this Han Jian was like. And frankly, I think that's a, a lot of pure conjecture. We don't really know. I mean, after all, the Han Dynasty was 2,000 years ago, from about 200 BC to 100 AD, 200 AD. So this is just too long ago. We have no real information about how they were used. We see a few pictures, uh, you know, illustrations from Han tombs showing them used with two hands. But that's not really much for us to go on on how these were really used. And, and honestly, if we look at how swords were used during the Qing period, that's just too, too many years later, too many thousands of years later, to really say, to try to say how a sword was used in the Qing and how that compares to the Han. But if we look at these swords, we can get some idea and make some suppositions about their use. Uh, one is they have this very long handle. And so, and many examples are even longer. Many examples are over a meter, 1.3, 1.2 meters long, whereas an average Qing Jian would be more like 75 centimeters long. So they were considerably longer. This example is closer to what swords in the Qing would have been like, uh, the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty. However, m like I said, many were much longer. Uh, but if you look at this sword and you look at the existing examples, some of them are in bronze, they're very narrow. Uh, and even with the two-handed use, they don't give you the feeling like they could really give a robust cut. I mean, during that time on the battlefield, people had very good armor. Soldiers were really well armored. And so you, if you're going to strike with a blade and you have a two-handed sword, you really want to have a, a, a more solid sword. And when you look at these, the edges are rather parallel, but then here, about halfway down, it necks down, kind of like a you know, a rifle cartridge, and it's much thinner. But it's really telling us that this sword is not weighted heavily for a cut, and it's really set up for a thrust. Now, I find that very interesting because Chinese swordsmanship that we're used to today, Genfa, is really a cut and thrust kind of system. There's plenty of powerful cuts, there's quick little cuts, and of course there's using of the tip for quick pokes and for jabs and for thrusts. This sword will not really give a powerful cut. So that makes me think that this type of swordsmanship at that time during the Han Dynasty was probably very point oriented. Very little, you can, can give a cut, just not a robust cut. And so that's quite interesting because that means that Chinese swordsmanship over time really changed dramatically from its origins in the Han Dynasty. So now if we zoom in, we look at these and thinking this is really probably more of a civilian weapon and a sign of status and rank during the Han Dynasty. These are uh, lacquer fittings. These would have been either carved out of hard stone or would have been bronze fittings uh, in the Han Dynasty. But as you can see, this is quite a lavish piece with interlocking serpents and dragons. So this was not a commoner's sword. This was not an average person's sword. And it also makes me think when we, when we see these surviving examples of these Han swords, they're usually fairly lavish. And it makes me think that these were also uh, symbols of rank. So let's have a look at this scabbard slide. Uh, this is an interesting feature of Han swords and very early Chinese swords. Uh, the swords we're more typically used to seeing, the ones that, from the Qing and Ming dynasty, the, sword, the jin and the dao are slung from lanyards from the sword belt. During the Han dynasty, they used these scabbard slides. And what you had was the belt went through a slot at the base of this fitting, and that held the sword higher up so that the hilt of the sword was in front of the wearer, where it was easily within reach of the sword hand. So here we have a closer look at the shape, and as you can see, it's a, a serpent that's intertwining, raveling around itself. Of course, a piece of this intricacy was never meant to touch the ground or to drag.